Good morning. We'd like to start. Can we ask the people? There's those of you at the door. There's lots of seats down front. <coughs> you want to come on down and take these places here? There's lots and lots of places to sit. We have places down here. If you'd like to come on down, there are a couple of places in the back. Fill in. I'd like to thank you all for coming this morning. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, this is the first meeting of um, the Haiti Working Group for the 2010-2011 program year. Uh, we're looking forward to a very busy schedule ahead, which will include the move of USIP into our new headquarters building in April. And uh, there's some wonderful pictures in the hallway of the new headquarters. Uh, as you can see from the uh, stack of publications out on the table outside the door, uh, we've had a very busy summer. And we have um, three new peace briefs uh, that are in the table outside. The latest one is by Alex Berg. It deals with the issue of crime, politics, and violence in post-earthquake uh, Haiti. There's two others which detail uh, the circumstances in Haiti over the summer uh, in terms of recovery and reconstruction. We have two new USIP special reports. Um, the first deals with um, crowdsourcing crisis information in disaster-affected Haiti. It's a report on work done by Yushadidi, Yushahidi, um, and uh, immediately after the quake, they use cell phones and open source crisis, ma crisis mapping software to direct search and rescue operations immediately. And um, in a circumstance where they broadcast a number to call on your cell phone if you were in trouble, uh, people could call that number. The message would be flashed up to a group of students working in a basement at Tufts University. Uh, it would be mapped out using uh, Haitian assistance, where it would be flashed back to the U.S. Marines or search and rescue teams, and people would be on their way within a matter of minutes uh, to the rescue. Very interesting stuff. And also a new report on education and conflict in Haiti which discusses the history of education in Haiti and the challenges facing the restoration of an educational system in that country. Uh, on the 31st of August, USIP hosted a public forum here on the issue of violence and rape in Haiti after the earthquake. Representatives from several NGOs were present and they talked about the work they'd done in trying to reduce uh, violence against women in that country. There is a um, audio recording of that program on the website if you go to the USIP homepage, click on Haiti, and then you'll see the, uh, uh, the link. Uh, a written report on that summarizes that event will be available in the next few weeks. And finally, uh, I'd like to ask you to mark your calendar. There's an announcement outside on the table. On the 29th of uh, October, um, the former prime minister of Haiti, Michelle Pierre-Louis, will be here. Uh, to uh, give us her thoughts on the election and, uh, and Haiti's future. Um, this morning, we're extremely pleased to have with us Jim Dobbins and Keith Crane from uh, RAND, who are going to be talking about their, their report. Uh, as always, we're delighted to have the chairman of the Haiti Working Group with us, uh, Professor Robert McGuire uh, from Trinity University. And so I will begin by turning the meeting over to Bob, who will introduce the panel. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the USIP. Uh, before I say anything further, I would just like to remind you to please um, mute or turn off your cell phones. Um, here we are. October 13th, roughly eight months after the earthquake that shook Haiti. And it seems to me that the news coming out of Haiti, what little there tends to be of it these days, um, is often contra a contradiction of hope and despair. Um, it's hopeful, for example, that the Interim Haitian Reconstruction Committee, which met last week um, and approved $777 million of projects, that's a hopeful sign. 
It's a little less hopeful when you realize that those $777 million are not completely available for projects at this point. I'm particularly hopeful because I hear reports of interesting developments outside of Port-au-Prince in the decentralization or deconcentration of the country in such areas as road building and infrastructure improvements, decentralized industrial parks. That's somewhat hopeful. But then on the less hopeful side are the stories that dominate of the continuing trauma of internally displaced people, the lack of housing and the issue of rubble, and also of the slow disbursement of funds that have been pledged. So it's a yin and a yang for Haiti these days. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is the political side with elections coming up for Haiti's parliament and president on November 28th. So we have three speakers, four speakers, sorry, to help us sort through some of these issues today in our meeting entitled Building a Better Haitian State. I will introduce them extremely briefly because you have their bios. They were available outside. You could pick them up after the meeting if you didn't pick one up on your way in. But speaking first will be Megan Curtis. And Megan is Senior Advisor of the Office of the Counselor and Chief of Staff Cheryl Mills at the U.S. Department of State. Following Megan will be James Dobbins, the Director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center of the RAND Corporation and the co-author of the RAND Report on Building a More Resilient Haitian State. And I should add, this is not the first time I'm introducing Jim. When we had the Haiti program at Georgetown years ago in the late 90s, and he was working as the special envoy to Haiti, well, I had occasion to introduce him then as well. So um, it's been a long and steady uh, commitment to Haiti. We have following Jim will be Keith Crane, who is the Director of Environment, Energy, and Economic Development at the RAND Corporation and also a co-author of the RAND Report. And last but certainly not least will be Alex Dupuy, a Distinguished Professor of Sociology from Wesleyan University in Connecticut and the author of at least three um, well-renowned and recommended books on Haiti. So with that done, Megan, it's all yours. Thanks, Bob, uh, and uh, thanks all, all of you for coming today. Um, thank you to the RAND Corporation, whose report on uh, rebuilding the Haitian state is really an excellent resource. Encourage everybody to um, take a look at that. It uh, has been a, a great resource for us at the State Department, um, and, and uh, Jim and all of his years of knowledge working on Haiti uh, is uh, really a benefit. Um, so I'm going to uh, sort of run through a very brief PowerPoint here. Uh, giving you a snapshot look at what about the new uh, Haiti strategy for the U.S. government um, is different, and specifically what about that new strategy aims at strengthening the Haitian state um, and moving in a new, a fundamentally new direction uh, for U.S. foreign assistance. Um, to start off, we, we, we framed the new Haiti strategy with, with five key principles, and the very first principle among them is USG assistance will be country-led and build country capacity. Um, uh, this is something I think I, I've, maybe some of you have been here on prior occasions. Uh, I, I've spoken and um, some of my other colleagues have spoken about uh, the process in the U.S. government to review the Haiti policy, which started back in March of 2009. Um, and one of the big things that uh, – one of the big findings that we came away with um, well before the earthquake is that – uh, the consistent approach to channeling foreign assistance around the Haitian state um, has, has effectively left a shell. Um, if, we, if we do not either fund or support capacity building within the Haitian state, we cannot expect to have a strong, strong institutions or any measure of sustainability. Uh, so this was the first principle among five, um, the others being um, comprehensive and integrated, leveraging other donors, 
um, using multilateral mechanisms, which I'll note later. Um, the U.S. government just last week announced $120 million to the multi-donor trust fund run by the World Bank, which is a significant uh, contribution and also a, a departure uh, from past practices in terms of using multilateral mechanisms for development. Um, so from there, uh, I think the first point of departure in, in terms of developing the USG strategy is to say, if this, if this strategy is in fact country-led and builds country capacity, what is it that the Haitians actually see as their main needs, as opposed to us deciding what their main needs are and how we can best address them? So right here is a, is a sort of quick snapshot breakout of, of uh, the four key pillars that were identified by the Haitian government in the wake of the earthquake as to their, uh, their reconstruction needs. Some of these uh, speak to greater needs that existed before the earthquake. Some of them are more specifically related to, uh, to needs that were uh, derived uh, or, or precipitated by, by the earthquake in terms of destruction. Um, territorial, economic, social, institutional. Um, historically, donors will gravitate towards category number three. Uh, social. Um, this is obviously, or not obviously, but but it frequently ends up being some some of the least sustainable development that we do because we're bringing in doctors and nurses, educators, and so forth, um, uh, but not necessarily investing in systems. So this is something that we, you know, we historically as as well have have gravitated towards. A lot of our portfolio in the past in Haiti has been focused on uh, sort of. Um, I would say uh, health, education, uh, stability operations, and humanitarian assistance. Um, so our our approach to this was to say both a what are the the highest priorities of the of the Haitian government and b where are other donors not going to play um, and where can we be effective in filling in those gaps. Um, I think one of the big departures on the ground in Haiti is the, uh, is the advent of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission. Um, this is a uh, organization that is co-chaired by uh, Prime Minister uh, Jean-Max Bellerive and uh, former U.S. President, President, uh, President Clinton, and has a number of board members, I believe it's 16, but perhaps more at this point, um, consisting of uh, Haitian government represents representatives from all branches of the government, including parliament, uh, unions, the Haitian private sector, uh, CARICOM, and all major donors. And that and that is uh, the threshold being any donor that commits over $100 million for reconstruction. Um, beneath that board is uh, a secretariat, which is uh, just now beginning to, to be staffed up. Uh, I think the IHRC, which is the unwieldy acronym uh, for this institution, uh, has been soliciting uh, both secondments as well as funds from the international community to support the operational costs of this operation. Um, the thing that distinguishes this, uh, I think, um, it, really from, from the past is that it puts the Haitian government in the place of actually being a part of the process of planning that happens with the international community. So instead of international donors deciding what it is that they think should happen in Haiti, they have to submit their plans and proposals to this commission uh, for approval. Then the commission can come back to the, to the donors, make tweaks, changes, uh, or reject them flat out, or give an approval, and then it goes back to the implementing partner to, uh, to, to actually do the implementation. It's not a funding uh, mechanism. Money does not flow through the IHRC. Um, but it is sort of a, a um, I'd say, a, um, a glorified planning ministry. Um, it also, I, I think the idea is, as it, as it continues to develop, to ha be something of a one-stop shop for um, setting up businesses, getting land permits, construction permits, and so forth. It's not there yet. Um, but I think the, the, the real value here is, is two things. One is that the government has a say in, in how things are, are being done and what projects donors are, are, uh, are, are committing against and how they prioritize those projects. And two, um, I, think, I think is the sort of externality that all of us sort of expected would happen but didn't realize how valuable it would be, is that all the major donors and very high-level decision makers from all of those donors are now in a room together on a regular basis and know each other and work together and uh, collaborate on projects together. And this is big. This, is, this, is, uh, this has not happened in Haiti in the past. 
Um, this is a snapshot of the of the uh, IHRC website, um, which I put up here just because this is, you know, this is a new thing for for Haiti having a public portal that people can tap into and look and see what uh, what's going on. I just want to also take you to this site very briefly um, and show you some of the things. You know, you can look at what are the pledges. Um, actually, the pledge page is super interesting um, and. You can see, look on here and scroll around and see, um, you know, how much donations have been done, how much of it is new funds, how much of it is uh, is uh, pre-existing pledged money. Um, it's a very useful tool. Um, not only that, but it allows for digital submission of project proposals so that you can have some level of efficiency in terms of getting this done. Um, so back to this. Oh, that's the wrong one. Okay, uh, so this here just gives you the, the basic frame of the USG strategy going forward, the five principles, um, four pillars. The two, the two things to concentrate on this slide is the four pillars and the three, qu three corridors, infrastructure and energy, food and economic security, health and other basic services, governance and rule of law, and then three corridors, which you'll see here um, on this map, uh, a northern corridor, a corridor running down the west coast up to and a little bit beyond St. Mark, and then the Port-au-Prince corridor. Um, this is an, also a pretty significant departure from past uh, practices for the U.S. government. And the idea here is to really, you know, uh, I think take a deep dive on the four pillars that we're addressing in each of these corridors. So if it's um, security and rule of law, it's rebuilding all of the uh, judicial infrastructure, the police, uh, um, uh, the prisons, uh, if it's on, on health care, it's uh, rebuilding a lot of the public health infrastructure and helping the systems actually function um, effectively uh, and so forth. Um, housing, agriculture, um, you'll see here noted these are, there are three fertile plains that we've focused on which are um, really kind of ripe for uh, expansion of, of um, uh, cocoa and mango um, production which is something that we're going to focus on in the agriculture piece. This is not to say that we won't be involved in other parts of the country, but it will be sort of a, a core package in the whole country and then a targeted comprehensive package in the corridors. Um, so now just quickly to go through the four pillars and focus on what is it about these that focuses on, um, on building state capacity. Um, the infrastructure and energy piece, this is going to be targeting uh, about 140 IDPs 140,000 IDPs uh, for rehabilitated homes and uh, new construction, both inside Port-au-Prince and outside Port-au-Prince in terms of uh, in, in, in support of the decentralization plan. Um, secondary and tertiary roads outside of Port-au-Prince, um, rehabilitating, expanding the electricity grid, reforming the ele uh, regulatory system, and then uh, providing alternative, char uh, alternative to charcoal cooking fuel. Um, the key capacity building elements on this is um, we're working on a mortgage finance facility with OPIC, um, the IFC, and CHF. Um, we're, we're giving technical support to the planning ministry, the IHRC, um, to do urban planning, to build, uh, to put together building codes, uh, to do land enumeration, to put together a pre-cadaster, which in turn will become a, a land cadaster for, for land titling. Um, and then I think the big piece on this is taking on the electricity sector in a big way, which means really getting involved with the state and helping to um, clean out the, uh, the electric, electric parastatal EDH, which has uh, historically had very significant problems in terms of administrative administration and, and, and maintaining the systems. Um, Food and economic security, um, I'd say on this piece, it's, it's a, a really more of a, uh, on the economic security piece, is working with the central bank uh, to provide credit guarantees and new financing to banks so that they can get, uh, um, get loans that, were, that are troubled assets or troubled uh, loans after the earthquake back up and running, refinanced. Um, and get some new cash flowing uh, so that businesses can reopen and restock and rehire workers. 
Um, health and other basic services. The, the big piece on the, on the health front for us is going to be really investing in the health, health ministry and moving away from what we had previously done, which is almost complete focus on service delivery, um, to, to expanding our focus uh, with a lot of new funds that are coming in on this sector to do health system strengthening. And that means helping the Ministry of Health uh, manage HMIS systems, health information systems. Um, uh, it means training doctors and nurses. It means allowing the, the, the um, health ministry to actually manage all of the NGOs that operate in the country, set standards, and, and move towards a robust performance-based contracting system to have them operating in what are now increasingly sort of hybrid public-private um, health facilities across the country. Um, governance and rule of law, um, I think, you know, the, the RAND report is really excellent in this regard in terms of looking at the administrative fixes that need to be um, taken on or reforms that need to be taken on within the, within the uh, Haitian government. Um, one we're going to be working with uh, the Department of Treasury to work on uh, a lot of kind of boring stuff that's incredibly useful, like um, budgeting, tax revenue collection, um, planning, uh, payroll, civil service reform, um, I think is something that we've been talking to the World Bank about um, going in heavy on. Uh, these are not sexy things, and they're not things that are easily done, but they're things that we haven't tackled or tried to tackle ever um, really in a, in a very significant way, and it's something that we really feel is necessary now. And, you know, everybody talked about there being an opportunity or a break from past practices and with the earthquake, and I think that may be still the case, um, but uh, I think it's, it's also just this is, you know, with all of the attention on Haiti right now, we've all come to the realization that it's time to, to think differently about what are the things that we put our money into, um, that it's not just Band-Aids, but it's, it's actually a uh, re-foundation. Um, one other thing I should note that we're, we're going to do on the governance side, uh, which I think is interesting, is, is actually imitating a project that was done in Liberia with uh, Haitian government fellows. So these will be fellowships targeting Haitian diaspora to serve as special assistance to minister, ministers within the cabinet uh, to basically perform middle management tasks that right now there is no capacity to do. Um, and that may be a Fulbright program um, that we're developing right now that we could replicate in other countries. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, elections, this is pretty uh, standard, a lot of the stuff that we do in most elections, uh, international domestic observation elections planning, uh, sort of logistics, uh, uh, civic education, voter mobilization, some new things that we're doing in here in terms of polling and, and uh, funding civil society organizations to host public debates, uh, politi political support, party support, and then media support. Uh, so just to wrap up, you know, a couple of big things that I think are important about the way in which the new Haiti strategy is addressing the kind of uh, the need to really uh, support the Haitian state, support Haitian institutions, and try to really rebuild them. Um, a couple of big things. Budget support is a big thing. This is something that we haven't done before directly. We have previously done uh, debt relief. Um, now we're doing actual budget support. This is about, right now, a modest $17 million in terms of the U.S. contribution. Uh, but that could grow going forward if we, if we find it to be a successful operation. Um, obviously working inside institutions with um, technical experts and embedded uh, uh, um, technicians and, and fellows, um, $120 million to the multi-donor trust fund, like I explained earlier. Um, investing in public infrastructure, I think this is something we haven't done in the past. We're rebuilding the general hospital in Port-au-Prince. Um, so set, setting sustainability targets, um, this is a big thing in terms of if we're going to build something, how is the Haitian government going to take over maintenance in the long run? Um, and then uh, participation in the IHRC, which is obviously fairly new for all of us. Um, so that's, I think, basically the full picture here. Um, I'll turn it over to Jim or um, Keith to give the, the more elaborate picture on, on your study. But thank you. Thanks, Megan. That was great. Um, I'm going to I'm going to cede most of my time to Keith, who was the lead author on our study. 
I just want to say a few introductory words basically on the origins of the study. It has the origin in two, two things. First of all was my own experience in Haiti when I was uh, uh, the, the administration special envoy in the, uh, in the <coughs> mid-90s. Um, and uh, in the aftermath of the earthquake, um, it occurred to me that, uh, that, that it would be nice if we could avoid uh, some of the mistakes we made uh, back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, uh, among those mistakes, I think, was uh, believing we could fix Haiti in two years, believing we could fix Haiti on a budget of about $100 million a year, and thirdly, having a strategy that was almost exclusively focused on police and privatization. Almost all our efforts went into building the police force, which was fine, but there wasn't a, compa a, a comparable effort to uh, build a justice system or a penal system. Um, and the police thus eventually just, uh, 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 an excellent new police force receded back to the, low, to the average level of corruption and incompetence very quickly in the absence of those supporting institutions. And privatization, while it made absolute economic sense uh, for things like the uh, electric company and uh, the port and many other parastatals, um, I think we found in Haiti and I think the World Bank and others have found in any number of other countries <coughs> that it is politically one of the most difficult things to achieve and probably not something that you want at the forefront of your transformation strategy. Um, uh, the second uh, uh, contribution to this work on Haiti is uh, – is work that uh, Keith and I have been doing since I left the government in 2002. We've produced now six volumes of studies on nation building, including a three-volume history of nation building, a book called The Beginner's Guide to Nation Building. And our basic assessment of the problem in Haiti is that Haiti is located where it's always going to have hurricanes and occasional earthquakes. The reason that they're so devastating is because Haiti doesn't have a government that can plan for those kinds of disasters and respond to those kinds of disasters. And nothing we do to respond to this disaster is going to help unless we fix that underlying problem. And so we produced a report that's very much focused on uh, the state building agenda in post-earthquake um, Haiti. Keith? I might note that another of the authors is in the audience, Charlie Reese who's on a six-month uh, uh, leave of absence from RAM to be the uh, executive vice president of the Clinton Bush Fund for Haiti. Uh, give a little plug first. This is available for free on our website. You can download it in electronic form, um, or you can purchase hard copy, but our, it's www.ran.org, so we'd be delighted to have people download it. Um, following up on what, um, what Jim and Megan had talked about, is that, uh, you know, the devastation is extraordinary in Haiti, especially Port-au-Prince. People have compared Port-au-Prince to um, World War II Europe, where we have, uh, there's not been a city that has been so devastated since 1944-45. But again, as harking back to what Jim had said, is that um, the earthquake and all its devastation really revealed or, again, highlighted the weaknesses in, of the <coughs> Haitian government because the earthquake in its own right was so severe, but the problems in terms of building codes, poor quality materials greatly exacerbated the consequence of the earthquake. Uh, so our RAND study then focused on what, what could be done at the state level to improve Haiti, and the Haitian government does have a number of advantages to draw on uh, unlike many of the other states we look at, uh, we've been working a lot on Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, these countries are, are, are riven by factional problems. They have long histories of violence. Uh, they have neighbors who are focused on tearing them apart. Haiti has the advantage of, of being located in, in a peaceful region. Um, its next door neighbor has been extraordinarily helpful as opposed to trying to uh, harbor insurgents to go across the border. Um, and if you will, it also has um, had extraordinary help from the neighbor writ large. We've had a Brazilian-led uh, international force to provide stability, and the U.S. has opened up its market like it has to no other country in the region. So given these potential advantages, um, our post-conflict nation-building books, I think, they have an optimistic spin to them. We see that there are uh, real possibilities for Haiti to move on. Uh, that said, um, the core problem has been ha the Haitian government's <clears throat> inability to develop and implement realistic policies and plans. Uh, there are 
on very numerous studies by other groups. Um, many of them and many of the people here have more experience than definitely I do on Haiti. Um, but what we focused on here is you're saying there seemed to be a gap in the, in the general discussion about where do we go from after the earthquake. And that was is what is really practical, what could you implement now, and what could you see some results in the next two or three years. So uh, we were, are not set out to reform or, or reconstruct a new Haiti. What we focused on is what really is doable and with a focus in terms of the government. So our study was designed to really assist what, you know, what types of plans should the Haitian government be focusing on and where should the international donor community be putting its uh, resources and its support. We focused on uh, these sets of these key areas and uh, these were deliberate. This is not just picking and choosing a little bit here, there, and everywhere. What we felt is, is these are really core areas that the international community and the Haitian government really needs to focus on. If you don't fix these, you won't fix anything. There are some other areas which would be nice to fix, um, and, but that said is that these we felt were really core, the key to uh, making some progress in Haiti. And so for each one of these, we first um, looked at what we saw as real challenges to the state. And then subsequently said, what are, what are some solutions that could be implemented um, both by the Haitian government and by the international community? In terms of public administration, I was very heartened to hear Megan's discussion of the focus on trying to build a civil administration. In the Haitian government today, there's no job descriptions, there's no civil service uh, uh, no civil service uh, structure for people to be promoted. There's really no accountability. There's no sense of, of what people should be doing or what their jobs are doing. And um, without having a, a, a civil service uh, that has some ability to implement government policy decisions, nothing happens. So we felt that this is probably the key recommendation we made is to focus on uh, public administration. Uh, there's a lot of fairly mundane, if you will, almost simple steps that need to be made, although these are, are, are difficult for those who've done them in the past. But first say, what's your job? What are you supposed to be doing? Secondly, what are standards for hiring and firing? Uh, up to this point in time, you know, in the United States, there's a very elaborate process of hiring people for the civil service. You have to demonstrate some capabilities and skills. Uh, we again advocated not a real complicated U.S. system, but just setting some basic standards, maybe in terms of literacy, uh, in terms of hiring people into the bureaucracy, uh, creating some sort of career path, if you will, for a Haitian civil servant. Where would promotions come from? Is it just that you have to be related to the minister or the director general, or there's a real career path where if you perform well, you will actually see uh, a a possibility of expanding both your responsibility and your salary. And uh, we also focused on the fact that um, the Haitian government really has not allocated resources and doesn't have resources to implement these types of changes. And although these are not very expensive, there's the types of things where a little bit of targeted money from the international community would go a long way. We then focused on justice and security. Uh, the key justice challenges have, um, in my view, really focus both in terms of the legal system itself, but especially in terms of the, the uh, point between arrest and uh, trial, conviction, and the, and the prisons. I, I was just horrified to find that 80% <coughs> of the people in the, in the Haitian prison system are on pretrial detention. And some people have been sitting in those prisons long, much longer than any type of sentence they would get for the crimes with their charged. Uh, it's, it's almost like out of the Middle Ages in that you could lose your papers if you don't, your family doesn't have the resources to hire a lawyer who will nag the judge. You can be lost, the paper's lost, and you could be there in essence forever. Uh, so this was a key problem. In addition to that, on the civil side, there's uh, uh, a major problem in terms of who owns what. And this is compounded, of course, after the earthquake in the sense that now if you're going to do rebuilding, who owns that parcel of land becomes very important in terms of who's going to be building on it. Our key recommendations here was to uh, first and foremost build on some of the initiatives that have been started by a number of groups 
to try to create and and to create and implement as quickly as possible comprehensive systems so that if you're arrested in Haiti, someone somewhere uh, in the system has your name, what you're charged for, and that it will then be in a system where you could also hold prosecutors and judges accountable for your particular case so that you eventually will emerge from the system or end up in prison and and finish your sentence and go back into society. Um, We also really focused on making uh, a concerted effort to create a property dispute resolution uh, based in part on a system of registering both property and uh, so there's an ability to start this reconstruction process so that people know who knows what and if there's an argument about it that it at least can be resolved fairly quickly. Uh, As part of that, it becomes very important in terms of registering births and deaths. Right now, Haiti has a very cumbersome system of registering deaths, and so many people who have had relatives and family, friends, fathers, uh, uh, wives, husbands who died in the quake are unable to get that property because they are unable to prove that that they are the survivors of people who have died in the quake. And this becomes extraordinarily important. They have uh, very limited resources. Maybe there's a bank account in Miami or someplace that they can't tap because they don't can't prove that their um, that their spouse has died. Uh, in terms of security challenges, I hats off to the international community for what has been done in Haiti uh, since the introduction of the UN force. Levels of violence and volatility in the country have gone way down. Uh, Haiti has not historically been a violent state. Uh, you know, it has some of the typical problems of the Caribbean, but nonetheless, uh, given the level of lack of governance, given the lack of, of, of police, et cetera, in the past, it is not notably a violent state. However, bringing in the international community has definitely dampened down the incentives for different political groups to try to spark violence, and this has probably done more prior to the quake to uh, create an environment for economic growth than anything else we've done. Um, Here our recommendations are uh, keep doing the good work. We don't see, you know, there's a temptation to say things are stable in Haiti. Why do we need to have this international force there? Um, We would argue that, you know, give a little time. We've got a big reconstruction process here. The political situation is kind of stabilized. But again, thanks to the international community, Let's give it at least five more years. Um, you know, over time, you might want to diminish the number of troops, but let's just keep it there for the time being, and that will provide a, a really a security framework in which we think there's opportunities for political development as well as for economic and uh, social development as well. Uh, in addition to that, the police have been a success story in the past. The police had a very bad reputation. Now they are the institution that's most highly um, highly regarded by the Haitian people, according to a number of polls. Um, But they really rely on the international community to make sure they get paid, to make sure that they have uniforms, uh, that that they can, uh, really, that they can operate. When we met with the chief of police in Haiti, uh, you know, if he wanted to, uh, you know, even get some new uniforms or he's interested in putting stations in the tent camps, He was spending his time talking to people like Megan and others asking for money to do this. Uh, We need to move beyond that and and make sure that both uh, he doesn't see asking for money as the first recourse for getting resources, but also making sure there's a budget there that these types of decisions can be made by Haitians and and that the police force can move on. In terms of economic policy and infrastructure, uh, Haiti is, of course, the poorest country in, in the hemisphere. It also has the notable, uh, <clears throat> it is also notable as the only country in the Western Hemisphere that's actually gone backwards in terms of per capita GDP over the last three decades. Um, but I think it's sometimes forgotten or not recognized as much as it should be that the reason why Haiti is poor is it's so hard to engage in any economic activity in Haiti, and this is self imposed. And you look at, um, you know, business registration is maybe not the most important thing in a country, but it is one of the most complex and lengthy in the world. More important are things like changing property uh, registration. I had read that just to, you have to have a notary public to sign off that I sold this property to you. Six, seven percent of the value of the property you have to pay to this individual just for a signature. And so naturally, uh, economic uh, Activity slows. It, uh, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily burden on the economy. So uh, here we had um, two, re- 
two suggestions. Uh, first and foremost, Haiti doesn't collect a lot of taxes um, in terms of the total revenue. They also don't spend an awful lot in public services. When I looked at the ratio of taxes to uh, what they're actually spending on, it's, it's uh, you know, one could say they, could, they should raise more taxes, but they better make sure they're spending on things that are needed by the public services. That said, there's a lot of little nuisance taxes, um, taxes that are actually designed for police or tax collectors or government officials to shake down businesses so they have to pay them. It would be better to kind of eliminate those and then focus on some of the taxes like uh, value-added tax and potentially property taxes that could target some of the individuals in Haiti that do have the wherewithal to, to, to provide more money to the government uh, while at the same time eliminating some of the restrictions in terms of business activity. <coughs> Finally, and I would say more importantly in terms of economic policy, is to really focus on trying to eliminate and reduce these um, steps that impede businesses. Uh, USAID has had a, um, a fairly long history now and success in terms of creating one-stop processes where you go to one place in order, let's say, to pay your taxes or register your business or um, make a transaction in terms of selling property, whatever. It's these types of things that they can push forward. Also, just to push, push, push to start eliminating uh, particular steps. Often there's like 16, 17 different things in different offices you have to do in order to do a transaction. You can get rid of many of those and then put pressure on uh, within the Haitian government to accelerate those types of um, the time in which it takes to do that. Um, next to, you know, the longer term we argued that creating a civil administration was probably the most important thing to do in Haiti. On the medium term, the most important thing to do is, is to um, start building homes so that next rainy season, the next hurricane season, you won't have all these tents <coughs> in Port-au-Prince. Um, this is probably the key thing that the international community needs to do in order to um, make sure we don't have another humanitarian disaster. We dodged a bullet this year, or the Haitians did. Um, they did, weren't hit by a major hurricane, but in light of all those hundreds of thousands of people living in tent cities, this is, this is really important. People focus on Haitian infrastructure as a big problem. Yes, they don't have very good infrastructure, but what they've had in the past is they let wash into the Caribbean. There has been um, virtually no focus on once a road is built to make sure it's maintained. Uh, there's been uh, countless studies where people have said a road that's been well maintained, the rainy season comes, it's there when the rainy season's over. A road that is poorly maintained is gone. And uh, going forward, the key thing for Haiti is not so much that build it, it's more to maintain it. And I was really heartened to hear that the U.S. government is putting a major emphasis on any infrastructure that's being constructed is going to have a maintenance plan as well. Um, so what do we recommend here? Uh, first and foremost, get the rubble out. Uh, we had compared Port-au-Prince to the cities after World War II the first thing that happened after World War II in Warsaw and Berlin um, and Dresden was that people got out and they started hauling bricks and hauling the rubble away. Here we are eight months later. Um, there's been a little of that, but it's been extraordinarily lackadaisical based on um, the threats to Haitians that will that um, are there from the weather next year. And until you get the rubble out, until you have a place to build, nothing's going to happen. Uh, Haitians are very inventive. Uh, as soon as there's a place to build, people will start building, but until that rubble's gone, um, that won't take place. Uh, in addition to that, again, we focus on regulation. Uh, Haiti, the cost of importing a uh, container to Haiti is two or three times what it is in Port of Los Angeles. People in Los Angeles have incomes, you know, several times what they are in Haiti. Uh, this is probably the single most important thing that keeps, that keeps Haiti poor today because everything has to come in or go out. It's a very small, open economy, and so the cost of transportation is probably the single uh, single most important driver in terms of, of, of um, standards of living in Haiti because everything that people buy or much of what they have to buy has to be imported. Um, finally, we really focused on electric power. Uh, Haiti has two different systems. There's a private system of little gasoline generators out in, in, in the slums to diesel generators at the larger uh, uh, larger government buildings or private enter or private businesses. Stuff is very expensive. I pay 11 cents a kilowatt hour in Virginia. 
gasoline generators can be a buck. So people in Haiti are paying 10 times what I'm paying. Meanwhile, the state has had an electric power system where it is used as a patronage system. 13% of Haiti's very limited resources are going to provide fuel subsidies to wealthy Haitians who can tap into the state grid. No, no sense in terms of trying to get people to pay for power. No sense in even charging them the amount of money that's needed to keep those uh, generators going. Uh, and finally, we turn to look at social services. Here we focused on education and health care. Uh, Haitians are extraordinarily focused on training, on educating their children. It's their social security, it's their pension, it's their only route in which they really see their ability to um, raise the family standard of living as to educating the youth. So they spend a very substantial share of household budgets on education. Unfortunately, um, the services they get in, in um, return for those investments have been often are quite poor. We have an educational system which uh, roughly 80% of children are uh, go to schools which are not provided by the state. Uh, long term, there's only four or five countries in the world where the state does not educate most children. Long term, Haiti probably needs to go there, but it's not going to happen next year, the year after. Uh, so the, the real problem is, is then how do you um, create better value for parents in terms of the expenditures they're making on education? And uh, how do you make sure that there's better, better quality standards? And so here what we focused on was not saying the Haitian government or the international community should go out and build lots of new schools that the state would, would run. Instead, we said, let's build on the current system and have the Ministry of Education focus on um, ensuring that those schools that do operate meet certain minimal standards and encourage them to hit those standards is to provide subsidies to private sector teachers in exchange for both ensuring that they provide a certain quality of education, but they also show up at school and educate the students. In addition to that, Haiti has a number of uh, tests where students have to pass in order to go to the next grade. Uh, some schools are not been accredited or not able to provide those tests. We would argue that you need to push out and make sure that all schools do that. Health care challenges, you're well aware of these, that uh, very few people have health care. They spend 50% uh, of health care expenditures or more are paid out of pocket for the poorest country in the, in the region. And that, um, and that it's a hodgepodge. It's really not a system. You have uh, doctors flying from the states. I had a friend of the family who's been there twice, provide services for a week or two, but they can't provide long-term care. There are church groups. There's charities. There's some government institutions. And uh, a lot of this is uncoordinated. For example, my friend who is up in the mountain, up kind of mountains of Port-au-Prince, about 20 kilometers but by foot, um, there was a clinic that someone had built up there. They didn't have the money to keep it going. There were heart medicines. There were um, uh, equipment there that were could not be used there that could be used in a hospital, but it was kind of abandoned. And this is a type of uh, lack of coordination by donors, by charities, and uh, in terms of providing health care. So once again, here we focused on saying, um, let's get the, health, the Haitian state, in this case, out of the health care provision business and instead have the Haitian state become, um, become the coordinator, eventually become, pro in, in a sense, a, a provider of funds. But it would focus on ensuring quality standards and moving towards performance-based contracting so those institutions that do get state money or get your money or charitable givings Hit or provide a certain quality or level of, of, um, of services. Finally, we talked about donor cooperation. This is something Charlie Reese focused on. And uh, here, as you can see, there's a whole host of problems. One is that Haiti goes in and out of fashion, or Haiti causes itself to go in and out of fashion, depending on how the political winds blow. And so over the last four decades, uh, we've seen extraordinary ups and downs in terms of, of donor assistance. Uh, we're on the upswing now, and so it's very important that on this particular time of upswing, because it's not going to stay forever, uh, all the major donors have, there will be other crises, other countries that will need this assistance. So the question is, is how at this particular juncture in history can Haiti best use these funds and the international community help Haiti do that? And so we have had a, um, probably the, I would argue, one of the most coordinated, most thoughtful uh, donor 
cooperation efforts by donors to cooperate that we have had uh, in many places in the world, or maybe uh, the best I've seen so far. The question is, what else do they need to do? Um, IHRC is slowly getting its act together. We started to have some meetings, as we said uh, recently, Bob mentioned, it was $740 million in terms of projects are out there. Money's not quite there, but it becomes very, very important to put, uh, make sure that there's some meat on the bones, that this particular institution really learns uh, how to work together um, and implement these projects. Uh, secondly, we strongly uh, argue that not only should the United States, but the charities out there should really support the multi-donor trust fund. Um, you have these, Haitians kind of like this. They like the fact that um, if the United States USAID goes down there and says, well, we don't really want to provide this particular, fund this particular project, they go to Canadians or go to the EU or they go someplace else and, and ask for funds because it gives them some control and also uh, provides them with um, some flexibility, but there's an extraordinary time cost for the director generals and for the ministers in Haiti. They spend a huge chunk of their time every day um, coordinating with donors, filling out forms, making sure, looking for money, and then making sure that they can continue to get money uh, by, uh, by agreeing to what the donors demand. What, again, Charlie had pointed out is we never found a Haitian official who would say no. Uh, the Haitian government at this point in time is that we're poor, we would like to take as much, you know, if you've got some money on offer, a project on offer, sure, we'll take it. And so there isn't really a coordinated plan. We would argue that by focusing on both I IHRC and Walter Donor Trust Fund, we can just focus on uh, putting funds where the Haitians want it at the same time, making sure that uh, donors who have a new pet project just don't jump in and, um, and uh, are coordinate their activities with others. So this is kind of our focus. Again, first and foremost, our view is that unless the Haitian state becomes stronger and more functional, unfortunately, the probability of having another catastrophe is fairly high, and that the only solution long-term to prevent these types of catastrophes in Haiti is to create a much more functional and more competent state. Well, uh, thank you. I want to thank the USIP for inviting me uh, to participate in, uh, in this conference, and especially Liz uh, Panarelli for all the help uh, that she gave me in getting me here. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, give you a very different slant on things. Um, uh, while uh, I think it's... Uh, very important, uh, or it's a good idea, it would be a good idea if we, there could be a Haitian government that was strong, representative, responsive, and that addressed uh, the needs of the majority of Haitians. Uh, but I'm going to uh, focus my remarks mostly on the economic side of things, uh, since to me without uh, the, the groundwork for a more sustainable and, vi and uh, viable uh, economic uh, development in Haiti, uh, nothing else will, will matter much. So uh, testifying before the United States Foreign Relations Committee on March 10, 2010, former President Bill Clinton, who is now serving as Special Envoy to Haiti, uh, for the United Nations and as co-chair of the IHRC said that trade liberalization, the trade liberalization policies he pushed in the 1990s and that compelled Haiti to remove tariffs on imported rice from the U.S., quote, may have been good for some of my farmers in Arkansas, but it has not worked. It was a mistake. I had to live every day with the consequences of the lost capacity to produce a rice crop in Haiti to feed those people because of what I did, end quote. Two weeks later, Haitian Prime Minister Jean-Marc Berrive 
appeared in front of the Haitian state to present the government's post-earthquake recovery plans, known as the Action Plan for the Reconstruction and National Development of Haiti. The Action Plan, originally conceived by the U.S. State Department and co-chaired by former President Clinton um, and Haiti, sorry, the Action Plan, originally conceived by the U.S. State Department, uh, uh, co-chaired and now recommended the creation of this IHRC, which is co-chaired by Clinton, former President Clinton and Prime Minister Max Belrive, and is now, as I think you mentioned, uh, in charge of implementing the reconstruction uh, plans and projects uh, for Haiti after the earthquake. Now, when questioned by members of the Haitian Senate that Haiti, in effect, had surrendered its sovereignty to the IHRC, Prime Minister Belrive responded candidly that, quote, I hope you sense, you sense the dependence uh, in this document. If you don't sense it, you should tear it up. I am optimistic, however, that in 18 months, we will be autonomous in our decisions. But right now, I have to assume that we are not, end quote. These two rare admissions by high-ranking public officials representing the two sides of the international community Haiti partnership express succinctly the dilemma that Haiti faces in rebuilding its shattered economy in the wake of the massive destruction caused by the January 12, 2010 earthquake. As accurate as Prime Minister Belrive's statement about Haiti's dependence on and subordination to the international community is, That fact did not originate with the creation of the IHRC, and it is not as temporary as Belle Reeve suggests. Rather, rather than recounting here the long history of foreign involvement in and, and, and dominance in Haiti, we can consider the 1970s as having marked a major turning point in understanding the factors that created the conditions that existed on the eve of the earthquake and contributed to its devastating impact. In return for military and economic aid from the United States and other advanced countries such as Canada and France, the regime of Jean-Claude Duvalier, which succeeded that of his father, François, in 1971, turned over the formulation of economic policy for Haiti to the international financial institutions, namely the World Bank, the uh, IMF, the IADB, and so on. These institutions henceforth pursued a twofold strategy that succeeded on the one hand in turning Haiti into, into a supplier of the cheapest labor in the Western Hemisphere for the export assembly manufacturing industries established by foreign and domestic investors, and on the other hand, one of the largest importers of U- U.S. food in the Caribbean basin. These outcomes were achieved through a series of structural adjustment policies that maintain wages low, dismantled all obstacles to free trade, removed tariffs and quantitative restrictions on imports, offered tax incentives to the manufacturing industries on their profits and exports, privatized public enterprises, reduced public sector employment, and curbed social spending to reduce fiscal deficits. Foreign investors are attracted to Haiti primarily because of its abundant supply of unskilled cheap cheap, and relatively non-militant labor, its close proximity to the U.S. market, no foreign exchange controls, and free circulation of the U.S. dollar, tax incentives with exemptions on income and profits, imported raw materials, machinery, or other assets used in the operation of the assembly industries, as well as the export of uh, the assembled goods that are produced in these industries. Even though the gap between the wages of Haitian workers and those in other countries in the region was high enough to offset transportation tariff and other costs, the World Bank has consistently argued that these wages should not be increased for risk of deterring investors elsewhere. That is, to take the risk of sending investors somewhere else. By the end of the 1980s and early 1990s, however, the bank itself recognized in its own reports 
that despite all the advantages it had, the export assembly strategy it advocated did not create the conditions for a more sustainable development of the Haitian economy. Even at the height of its operations in Haiti in the mid-1980s, the assembly industry never employed more than 7% of the total labor force and did not contribute significantly to the reduction of unemployment. The industry had at best a neutral effect on income distribution, but a negative effect on the balance of goods and services because it encouraged more imports of consumer goods. The industry also contributed little to government revenues because of the tax exemptions on profits and other fiscal incentives, which along with the subsidized cost of public services and utilities represented a transfer of wealth to the foreign investors and the Haitian entrepreneurs who subcontracted with them for the operation of the assembly industries. Other than construction and services, mainly transportation and catering services, and some housing construction, the assembly industry did not contribute to the expansion of other industrial sectors, not only because it imported its raw materials and other industrial inputs rather than relying on domestic supplies, but also because the poverty wages of its workers did not stimulate the economy. Moreover, the products of the assembly industries were not used as inputs by other Haitian industries, but exported to the U.S. The the processing industry is entirely dependent on the U.S. or other developed markets for its products because it relies on contracts from from the firms from those countries. Thus, when the limits on import quotas are met, or if demand decreases, the industry cannot expand its production. Lastly, the assembly assembly industry drained more foreign exchange than it brought in. It did this in two ways. First, most of the profits of the foreign investors are not reinvested in that sector, but expatriated. And the absence of expanded investment opportunities led even Haitian uh, entrepreneurs to invest their savings outside of Haiti, most often in the U.S. Second, the import of consumer and producers' goods uh, surpassed the total exports of the modern industrial sector, thereby draining foreign exchange from the economy. The other side of this urban industrial strategy pushed by the U.S. and the international financial institutions was to dismantle Haiti's trade barriers and open its economy to food imports, principally from the United States. Although the Duvalier dictatorship embraced the assembly industry strategy, it resisted demands to remove the 50% tariffs on food, especially rice imports, that enabled Haitian farmers to continue to produce all the rice consumed in Haiti and limiting other food imports to about 19%. All that changed after Jean-Claude Duvalier was overthrown in 1986, however. The U.S. government successfully pressured the succeeding military governments to slash import tariffs, reduce subsidies to domestic agriculture, open the country to commercial activities, close or privatize public utilities, industries, and maintain wages low. When Jean-Bertrand Aristide was elected in 1990, uh, he sought to change these policies to protect domestic food production especially rice, against cheaper imports and raise the minimum wage of workers in the assembly industries. These efforts failed because of stiff resistance from the Haitian Chamber of Commerce, the IMF, and the USAID. The Haitian army soon toppled Aristide in September 1991, and when President Clinton returned him to Haiti three years later in October 1994, Aristide agreed to lower tariffs on rice and other food imports to 3%, and they have remained at that level ever since. These policies had drastic consequences for the agricultural sector and for Haitian farmers. Whereas in the 1970s, Haiti imported about 19% of its food needs, as I mentioned before, currently it imports well over 51%. It went from being self-sufficient in the production of rice, sugar, poultry, and pork, and other cereals to become the fourth largest importer of U.S. subsidized rice in the world and the largest importer of U.S. foodstuff uh, in the Caribbean. 
80% of all the rice consumed in Haiti is now imported. Trade liberalization then essentially meant transferring wealth from Haitian to U.S. farmers, especially rice farmers in Arkansas, and the U.S. agribusiness companies that export to Haiti and those Haitian firms that resell it on the domestic market. Not surprisingly, rice import has always topped the lists of imports in terms of profitability. Other than the negative impact on the Haitian economy, locating the assembly industry's primarily import of prints combined with the trade liberalization policies that exacerbated the decline of agriculture and the dispossession of farmers propelled migration from the rural areas to the capital city and its spreading squalor. Port-au-Prince grew from a city of about 150,000 inhabitants in 1950 to 732,000 in the early 1980s and to approximately 3 million people today, or nearly one-third of the Haitian population of about 10 million people. Those who could not find employment in the assembly industries, which never, as I mentioned, never employed more than 6 7% of the labor force, swelled the ranks of the unemployed or the informal sector, which became the largest source of employment for the urban population. Since the 1970s, migration to the neighboring Dominican Republic, the Caribbean, and North America increased dramatically to the point that Haiti is now heavily de- dependent on remittances from its immigrants, from its emigrants, which in 2008 represented about 19% of Haiti's GDP. Indeed, um, the remittances of Haitians to Haiti are now worth more than Haiti's exports. This then brings us back to Clinton's statement at the beginning. If he really believed that the policies he forced on Haiti were wrong, then he would be advocating for their repeal and encouraging Haiti to reintroduce its protectionist policies to rebuild its agriculture and return it to its self-sufficiency in the production of rice and other crops. Such is not the case, however. On the contrary, Clinton is now spearheading the very same failed strategies that have been repackaged in the post-disaster needs assessment document prepared by the Haitian government with the assistance of the international community. That repackaged strategy had in fact been spelled out well before the earthquake in a report commissioned by the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2009 and uh, re- written by Paul Collier, a former World Bank official and now professor of economics at Oxford University. And now we see the Wren report um, repeating the same mantra. Ignoring the evidence of the past four decades, the Collier's report lays out the same dual strategy advocated by the international financial institutions and the U.S. since the 1970s. The only difference is that it calls for expanding the export zones for garment production beyond the two that currently exist in Port-au-Prince and Wanamint, located near the border with the Dominican Republic, in order to create clusters of such industries and similar zones for the production and export of selected agricultural crops, stress-sized mangoes. I should add, in passing, that the Wanamint zone is one of the most fertile agricultural sectors in Haiti, and when Aristide was president the second time around, in return for, uh, at least, he hoped to get some money from the World Bank uh, and, he, you know, to, to help him, you know, manage things, uh, he expropriated, evicted farmers from that region in order to build this uh, free trade zone near the Dominican Republic, largely because the DR uh, had surpassed its quotas in assembly manufacturing export to Haiti, I mean to the U.S., and simply so by locating these industries on the other side of the border, they could mark them as having been manufactured in Haiti, therefore not be subject to the quota regulations and so on. So that's an aside. Now, um, for Collier, the reason for this dual strategy is straightforward. Haiti needs to take advantage of the Haiti Hemispheric Opportunity Act through Partnership Encouragement Act of 2008, or the HOPE II Act, enacted by the U.S. Congress, that grants Haiti and the Dominican Republic duty-free access to the U.S. up to 70 million square meter equivalents, and I think it's now been raised 
too close to 250 million square meter equivalents, if I'm not mistaken, um, which President Clinton advocated. Um, and so th thus, only by creating sufficiently large clusters of these industries, Collier argues, could potentially employ several hundred thousand workers, could Haiti and not could employ several hundred thousand workers, could Haiti become competitive on a global scale? The key to Haiti's competitiveness, of course, is its abundant and low wage but and highly uh, high quality labor force, which rivals that of China. And China is always the standard bearer because China dominates uh, this industry uh, glo globally. Establishing these zones of garment production and the jobs they would create is also necessary, according to Collier, to reduce the population that lives off the land. And in fact, the Rain Corporation mentions also there are too many people living off agriculture in Haiti. Um, and Haitian agriculture could then switch to more land-intensive production, amenable to more inputs and greater output. In addition to increasing food production for the national market, Haiti needs to establish zones for the production of export crops such as mangoes. Mangoes are important not only because they are a valuable crop, but because the, tr three lo the trees are large enough to have a substantial root network that would thus decrease soil erosion and contribute to the, proce to the process of reforestation. As mentioned, former President Clinton fully endorses that strategy, as does the action plan for the, of the Preval government and the international community. Yet, responding to questions from reporters after the International Donors Conference in New York City on March 31, Clinton elaborated on the policies he once championed and admitted that, I quote, these policies have failed everywhere. They've been tried. You just can't take the food chain out of production and go straight into an industrial era. It also undermines a lot of the culture, the fabric of life, the sense of self-determination. And we made this devil's bargain on rice, but it wasn't the right thing to do. We should have continued to help them be self-sufficient in agriculture. And that's a lot of what we are doing now. We're thinking about how can we get the coffee production up how, we, how can we get the mango production up, the avocados, and lots of other things? But not one a word from Clinton about resending the trade policies that have had these devastating effects. What is noteworthy, however, is that neither Clinton nor the, the, the Collier Report, the Action Plan, nor now the Wren Corporation Report, explains how, how Haiti is to regain self-sufficiency in rice or food production generally when none of them is calling for repealing the trade liberalization policies Clinton decried and which neither the administration of President Obama nor the U.S. Congress is contemplating. Neither is it explained how the expectations of hundreds of thousands of jobs in the government industry will pan out in Haiti when the combined share of the U.S. market for the government export industry in the countries of the Dominican Republic and the, the country of the Dominican Republic Central American Free Trade Agreement which includes Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala, has declined from 13.3% in 2004 to 9.8% in 2008 and caused the layoffs of 10,000s of workers in these countries. As David Wilson put it succinctly, the whole plan to expand garment industry in Haiti is, quote, a race to the bottom. It isn't really about creating jobs. It's about relocating them when the professors relocating them to Haiti and uh, when the professors and polit politicians say they will help Haitian workers by giving them jobs, what they really mean is that they plan to take the jobs away from Dominican, Mexican, and Central American workers and pay their Haitians even less for doing the same work, end quote. That the international financial institutions, their paid consultants and heads of state, current and former, disregard the evidence of their failed strategies and continue to advocate them, advocate them should not be surprising. Their objectives have never been to promote meaningful and sustainable development uh, in countries like Haiti, but to create outlets for the products of the advanced countries and sources of cheap labor for their manufacturers. 
it comes as no surprise to me then that the Rain Corporation should fall in line with that objective. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for all of our speakers and your um, very insightful comments. We do have about uh, three quarters of an hour for discussion. Uh, we will entertain questions from members of the audience. Uh, we will need to use these microphones so that those watching on the uh, webcast can hear you. Um, I would like to start the, the presentation um, by asking Jim Dobbins something, because um, I know you haven't spoken that much yet. But you, you did make the, the comments that um, um, there were certain lessons that were learned from the experience of the mid-'90s. And um, it struck me as I was listening to Alex's um, analysis, which incorporated much of the, the mid-'90s in it, um, that if you might comment um, on some of his critique and, and maybe help us understand if some of those lessons that have been learned might incorporate some of his critique as well. Well, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, uh, Increasing or decreasing Haitian tariffs on um, imported food wasn't a major element of American policy in the mid-90s, although it was an element. It certainly wasn't where we put most of our emphasis. Um, I, 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 think the, I think the problem with the concept of Haiti as self-sufficient in agriculture is, first of all, all arable land in Haiti is currently under production. So you can't, you know, short of massive reclamation projects, um, uh, any shift from uh, one product to another simply means you're producing more low-value uh, products, rice, for instance, and less high-value products, mangoes, for instance. So there is a trade-off. Um, secondly, there's not enough land, not enough arable land in Haiti to feed its entire population. Looking back at a time when Haiti was self-sufficient, is a time when it had a population half the size of today and more arable land. But arable land has been lost as a result of um, erosion uh, and other uh, environmental devastation. Um, so I, 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 and finally, of course, the, the, the idea that you would raise the price of food in Haiti uh, at the current time, given the uh, levels of income there, um, uh, strikes me as uh, counterintuitive. Um, any other comments um, on that? Alex, do you? No, oh, sorry, Megan. I just think he's wrong. <laughs> Megan, go ahead. Um, I, one thing I should note is that Haiti is a is uh, one of the focus countries in the um, in the Secretary's uh, Feed the Future strategy, which is a food security um, strategy for for um, developing countries. Um, so the U.S. government is, in fact, actually investing heavily in agriculture production in in Haiti. Um, in the fertile plains, uh, focusing on both cash crops and staple crops. Um, outside of these fertile plains in our development corridors, we'll be focused primarily on um, on export high value uh, products. Um, I think the same calculus um, has been done on our end in looking at the level, the amount of arable land that's available to to produce uh, uh, staple crops. Um, and the need, frankly, um, to focus on on nutritional staple crops. Um, that's not necessarily rice, but um, but groundnuts and pigeon peas and things like that. That actually can can complement the nutritional programs that we're trying to do, both in food security and healthcare. Um, so you know, I think that there's just a there there are limited uh, arable resources in Haiti right now, and that's the and that's the um, the fact that I think a lot of the international community and Haitians as well have, have kind of come to face. That's something that we also need to to work on, and is a, a big piece of the food security strategy in Haiti. Is um, as opposed to being a, a purely value chain. Uh, based approach um, in in Haiti, we're actually doing much more of a watershed based approach, which is to um, reclaim and restore watersheds throughout Haiti, so that you can you know grow trees back, so that you don't have massive floods and landslides every time hurricanes pour through the country. 
Okay, we have a questioner over here. Uh, sir, could you please identify yourself and your affiliation and then ask a question? Yeah, Mike McDonald, Global Health Initiatives. We worked a lot in Haiti on uh, the infectious disease issues um, the first six months after the earthquake. Um, I, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around the numbers. Uh, I believe that, uh, Alex, you had said that there's only about 20 percent or 20 some odd percent food, food production for the local population today. I believe that's what you said. Is, could you give me the number? I want to be clear on that. Well, is that including exported agricultural goods? Okay, what is it? What what amount of food is produced for Haitians today? Well, the total food food production in Haiti, from what I understand, is about slightly less than 50 percent. Haiti imports about more than 50 percent of its food needs, so the rest is covered by local production. Okay, so you had stated that um, Haiti was self-sufficient at perhaps five million people, but the uh, arable land has been substantially degraded since then. And the now, population's doubled. So you have 10 million people today. My understanding is in another 10 years you have roughly uh, 15 million people, and around 15 years you have roughly 20 million people. And I'm trying to understand why this is not similar to uh, Ireland in the potato famine. Um, if our, If the world economy degrades and you have this massive dependency on the outside world, I, I just can't see that Haiti is not going to go through a population crash given the deforestation and the dramatic uh, devastation to its watersheds. All 55 of the major watersheds are substantially degraded. So I don't see this report touching any of that. And I'm just wondering if this group would open the conversation to what we really are looking at here and what would really address the problem. Uh, if I may comment on this, um, you know, when these reports are being prepared by foreign experts and think tanks and even governments and so on, they don't talk to Haitian farmers. They don't talk to their the, the local peasant organizations and what their needs are and so on. None of them was really consulted. And in fact, the Haitian organ peasant organizations have been saying all along that what they do need is a sustainable pro uh, project of reforestation uh, because, uh, in fact, there has been massive erosion and that has uh, created, uh, that has affected the level of agricultural productivity. Another major factor in Haiti is the land tenure system, um, which is very, very detrimental to increasing yield crops. Because what you, the situation you have is that many of the farmers don't have effective title to their land. And so when they, when they pass on and they pass on their land to their children, the, the land becomes subdivided even further among the, the children. And, doesn't, so, and you don't have cont contiguous land holding by the farmers, which creates a problem. So they've been advocating for a long time for meaningful land reform programs. The largest uh, landholder in Haiti is, a gov is the Haitian state, which owes most of the land of the country. And so it wouldn't be very difficult to engage in a meaningful land reform program by redistributing publicly owned land. And when we talk about uh, deforestation, farmers do not cut land on their own land, do not cut trees on their own land. They go to public land to, dis to cut it. So if you have a, a meaningful and you have a meaningful refor reforestation program and uh, building robust trees and you encourage this, then you can we encourage the revitalization of agriculture. If you build adequate infrastructure, irrigation networks, and so on, you can then rebuild the infrastructure, the infrastructure of agriculture. But more importantly, I think Haitian, Haitian agriculture needs to be heavily subsidized, much like it is in the United States. And other, you know, in Japan, in, in France, in all the other Europeans, subsidize their agriculture. So it's not a matter of raising food prices for Haitians. It's a matter of subsidizing domestic food production that employs uh, farmers and keeps them from keep them from having to emigrate to the uh, urban centers or abroad, or going to the Dominican Republic to cut sugarcane for mostly U.S. industries. So. There are comprehensive things that could be done 
But if your objective is, like as I am arguing these plans are, if your objective is to make Haiti a sort of haven for foreign investments for cheap labor, then it's not going, to, these, policies, these priorities are not going to be established because you can't have it both ways. If you have meaningful health care reform, if you have meaningful education, if you have meaningful uh, subsidies of agriculture, Haitian wages are going to go up. That's not going to be good for the assembly industry, which only cares about going to Haiti if it has access to cheap labor. So one has to, uh, if you think about it systemically, then you see where the real bottlenecks are. It's not, I, I applaud the efforts, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to hear that the State Department is thinking about rebuilding Haitian agriculture. But not one word has been said about the policies that they have followed that have had these devastating consequences. So to me, it's contradictory. You can't say you want to build Haitian agriculture but then prioritize farmers in Arkansas. It doesn't make sense. Um, we have uh, questions coming in uh, from the uh, viewers on the Internet, and I want to put two of them together because they both deal with the same uh, issue. Um, Daniel asks, while money doesn't flow through the IHRC, is there no concern for corruption in the IHRC and paying off committee members to approve certain projects, et cetera? And Kennedy asks, um, how will the organization or the Commission on the Rebuilding of Haiti help the Haitians on the corruption inside of the public administration. So I know this issue of corruption generally comes up at these kind of issue, uh, fora. So does anyone want to tackle that? Sure. Um, on the, on the uh, question about um, on transparency uh, initiatives within the IHRC, um, I think if I could bring that slide up again, you'd see that there's a, um, a sort of uh, independent auditing authority that sits um, uh, to the side of the of both the board and the secretariat, um, that is uh, it basically audits operations, audits use of uh, operational funds, um, and just general uh, daily practices. Um, that operation is being stood up right now. Um, what I should say is the um, in terms of you know our our board members necessarily. Um, open to being paid off uh, to approve certain projects. These board meetings happen publicly, um, and it's a very robust dialogue. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of both Haitian and international uh, board members. Um, I would say that you know, these, are, these are very professional, sort of open door conversations. I, I don't think that this is a concern that, um, that anyone has at this time in terms of um, uh, of, of approving projects. I'd also say that the projects are funded by international donors. It's hard to believe the international donor would want to project approve so much that it would bribe the <laughs> IHRC in order to approve it giving money for some purpose in Haiti. So it's not clear who would have incentives to yeah. bribe in order to get projects approved when the projects are being funded by donors. That's right. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll turn to you. Right, thank you. My name is Ken Polsky, and I'm with Catholic Relief Services. Um, I do share the sort of um, one thing out of, out of the RAND report, which was the assumption that a, a well-functioning state is an enormous asset in terms of disaster risk reduction, for example. And the emphasis on uh, our, we want the outcome to be a, a stronger, more uh, viable state. It also needs to be more accountable. And I wonder where is the investment in civil society capacity strengthening that uh, seems that the, seems to be that there should be a tremendous amount of investment on non sort of state institutions to enable state institutions to become strong. Um, what those would be, I'm not sure. There's all sorts of um, whatever labor labor unions, agricultural unions, the ability of civil society to express itself. Um, coherently and in an organized fashion where they're accountable to their own membership because we can all go talk to, you know, three people in uh, the countryside and say we've consulted farmers, but how do farmers themselves express their needs in a powerful, meaningful uh, way that's, you know, not clientelistic or anything? So where's that investment? Uh, I mean, to be to be blunt, we, we really felt like there was too much 
diversion of effort in the international community. Um, I mean, hats off to people like yourselves for bringing private sector, um, you know, getting private donors to fund a operations. But we really focus on saying that until the state can do something, it doesn't do much good uh, to have either labor unions or farmers, you know, um, petitioning the government if the government can't implement anything. So we felt, you know, Haiti's often been referred to as the Republic of NGOs. Um, we didn't see the focus at this point in time should, in terms of donor, uh, state donor f funding, we really thought it should be concentrated on having a state so individuals then could petition the state and have something happen. Currently, you can petition all you want, nothing happens. Yeah, I just, Megan might want to say something about what role there is for funding for civil mm -hmm. society in, in the current program, but um, I'd say, you know, having an adequate functioning state is a prerequisite for any policy. It's a prerequisite for Alex's policy. I mean, you, the idea that the poorest state in the world is going to subsidize its agriculture strikes me as implausible. But even if that, if that were a policy adopted, it couldn't possibly be implemented unless you had a functioning Ministry of Agriculture that could oversee it. So all the money didn't flow into a few wealthy families. Um, the problem of overpopulation, it's a real problem. You've got a time bomb. Only a functioning government can deal with it, including population programs. Um, uh, so you need a, uh, and for civil society, as you know, we've indicated, if the civil society doesn't have a government that it can pressure, what is it doing? So uh, we do tend to think that, that solving our, the problem we focused on is a prerequisite for pursuing any of the policies that are competing for uh, attention. I, I would I would share the the view that that uh, the the preponderance of focus within the international community has been on funding civil society organizations and NGOs, and I think it, it, while that is obviously important, that has drawn away uh, resource uh, resources from actually developing the state. Um, that said, uh, we in our in our supplemental uh, package have. Um, over, I'd say, probably $60 million committed to kind of um, civil society strengthening um, communications uh, between the government and civil society. Uh, all of a lot of our elections uh, support goes towards civil society organizations to hold public debates, polling, um, focus groups. Uh, but th this is these are activities that have been going on for a long time, um, and uh, uh, you know. Even with that, I would say that without having a responsive government, it makes it very difficult. There's very little incentive for civil society groups to remain organized and cohesive. And that's what we've seen is, you know, you've seen uh, uh, organizations like NDI invest in um, initiative campaigns for many, many years. Um, and, you know, the minute the funding goes away, uh, a lot of these groups break up because they've got, you know, there's nobody on the other end once you, you know, pull your group together and, and put your campaign together. So you, you've got, it's the same, you know, it's the same issue we're dealing with on a lot of uh, fronts, similar to, you know, we spent all this money developing a police force in Haiti, but we never focused on developing a justice system. Y you know, there's cause and effect, and, you know, there's, you know, two pieces to, uh, to a lot of these uh, problems that, you know, you have to work on the front and the back end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alex, I was happy to see your exuberant concurrence with uh, some of what Jim was saying. Well, <laughs> qualified super concurrence. Of course, we need, of course, Haiti needs a functioning state. That I started my remarks by saying it needs a state that's responsive for the first time to the needs of the majority of Haitians. But uh, never mind. Let's <laughs> we'll take a question from this side, please. My name is James Kurz. I work for Fonc Jose, a microfinance bank in Haiti. Um, my question focuses more on I, I haven't read the RAND report, but just listening to your comments today, I'd like to hear more from RAND and other organizations that are doing this kind of research about tackling uh, the issues, the, tackling the questions that Haitian bureaucrats are struggling with right now. For example, land tenure and the whole issue of so many property owners who claim the same piece of land in so many cases where you have one piece of land with 20 owners who can produce you know, formal documents saying that they own that land. That's a really difficult challenge, and the procedures necessary to resolve a situation like that is a, a real challenge for the judicial system in Haiti. So uh, recommendations about how actually to tackle questions like that 
I, I think are, are necessary from the kind of thinkers that RAND employs. We recommend um, the uh, implementation of a non-judicial administrative property dispute mechanism, which would adjudicate property disputes in an expeditious manner outside the context of the existing judicial structure, which can't be fixed in time to address these issues. And a lot of the reasons that there's still rubble all around is nobody's quite sure who owns the rubble um, or the property that it's on. So that's one of our recommendations. And there are, case, I think there are instances at other places in the world, so there are models that could mm -hmm. be drawn on. Any other comments on the panel? Yeah, I, I would just say uh, the, the land title issue is huge, uh, a huge constraint to, to moving forward on the reconstruction process. Um, the U.S. government, in, in collaboration with the World Bank and a number of other U.N. habitat, have been working together uh, to try to come up with um, a sort of uh, you know, pre-solution and then the long-term solution. I think in the immediate term, there's a, a, a going to be a community enumeration process underway in which you know all the various claims can be laid out and just merely creating a database um, that uh, sort of lists out who all has claims to the land, what their you know claims are consist of, uh, is is enough for us to get started. I think on a on a on reconstruction within Port-au-Prince. Um, the alternative is uh, is another thing that we've been working on, which is to just find new land. Um, so the U.S. government has been working with the government of Haiti and a lot of large private landowners to work out deals in which they will give land for free uh, in exchange for some of the improvements that international community will make in that land in terms of electrification, roads, reclamation, whatever it, uh, whatever it is, uh, to build new homes uh, for for displacations that they can actually have real title to the land. Um, so in some ways, it's the new land that will be the easiest to solve uh, in terms of getting clear title, but uh, it's a long haul uh, to, to work at the um, inside the urban communities uh, where there's never been a system. Uh, Megan, don't back away from the microphone because our uh, Viewers have sent in a number of questions the, asking for clarification on U.S. and State Department role. One asks, um, how will the U.S. and its partners help curb the violence that is on the rise before and after elections? Another one asks, please clarify for us Haitians, or maybe that's U.S. Haitians, whether it is true that we are under U.S. occupation, are all decisions made for Haiti from the State Department? And a third one asks, when will the State Department release the $1.5 in aid funding and who will it go to, the Haitian institutions or the IHRC? Okay. Um, all right. I'll take them uh, <clears throat> in order. In terms of violence, um, actually, this is something that has been a real concern uh, for us. You know, we've all been focused on how do we re rebuild? What's the reconstruction strategy? How do we work together with donors? Meanwhile, you know, there's a whole uh, process at play in Haiti, both uh, related to elections and uh, just uh, general ambient, the rise in ambient and organized crime as a result of there being very little opportunity and uh, roughly 600 prisoners who escaped from prison after the earthquake. You've seen. Uh, reconstitution of gangs that um, that uh, were much more uh, prevalent in 2005, 2006. Uh, so uh, these are very uh, concerning trends. And in fact, uh, we just took a trip down to Haiti last, uh, not last week, but the week before, to meet with um, SRSG uh, Moulet uh, and the rest of the Minusta force to talk about what are we doing in terms of addressing gender-based violence that we're hearing, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, kind of increased reports about that, um, kidnapping, um, um, increased amounts of uh, drug traffic flows, uh, and uh, general sort of um, more violent crime that's happening in new parts of the city that we haven't seen before. Um, I, the, you know, I, I think our, we were, we were, Somewhat um, heartened to hear, you know, some of the new uh, approaches that the uh, Minusta forces are taking on, particularly with regard to gender-based violence. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the things that we're focusing on right now um, are training, uh, looking at hotspots, um, really keeping going on a lot of our cash-for-work projects, which keeps sort of 
um, unoccupied, unemployed youth who may otherwise turn to violence, um, put money in their pockets, um, keep the economy going, keep you know people uh, in in productive uh, jobs during the day. Uh, so this is, you know, from our side, that it's the, really the community stabilization approach uh, that was very successful um, in, in, you know, kind of tamping down crime in Cite Soleil prior to the earthquake, um, and it's something that we're trying to do in other hotspots within, within Port-au-Prince. We certainly hope not to have to go back to a strategy that is entirely focused on that kind of work because it's not about development. It's about, you know, um, uh, keeping, keeping things, you know, sort of uh, negative influences at bay. Um, on the second question about uh, U.S. occupation, um, I think that, you know, if you talk to a lot of the folks down in Haiti, um, they, would, they would say, uh, you know, A, they find the U.S. government's involvement there a, a force for good. In fact, we just had a, um, a survey that was done uh, recently. Um, that I would say surprisingly, people found that um, the the survey respondents found that uh, thought that Haiti was headed in the right direction. Um, the majority of them, 60 percent or more, I think, um, which was actually a rise over those who held that view prior to the earthquake. So I thought I found that fairly interesting. Um, but most also just had a generally positive view of the American influence um, in Haiti. In terms of you know our role in in uh, in the process, we're just we're a donor in the mix. Um, I think you know we try to play a, a leadership role in some spaces, given that we are the largest donor, and have a historical presence in Haiti. But we do not try to play an ownership role, um, and I, I think that's something that. Uh, uh, you know, the IHRC has, has been really great at bringing forward a lot of voices of strong partners who have been involved or have, been, you know, taken increasing involvement in Haiti, like the Brazilians, the Venezuelans, the Cubans, um, and we're working with them. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, uh, a, a b very big deal. There's a sort of public forum for all of us to get together, and it's not just the U.S. government, um, you know, making demands. Um, on the final point, the one point, uh, it's actually $1.2 billion, which was the supplemental package uh, that was approved by Congress in uh, late July. Um, it was appropriated. We had sent up the supplemental request uh, back in March, shortly after the earthquake. So there was a lengthy process for approving the supplemental out of Congress. Um, we then put together our spend plan uh, to send to Congress for approval. There's lots of hoops to get through to, to spend this money. but. It is now, uh, I would say, just days away from being able to be obligated. Um, so we should start spending that money um, within the month. Thank you very much, Megan, for addressing those. Um, this side, please. Uh, Ernie Prieg, uh, representing uh, Haiti Democracy Project today, but I spent my tour in Haiti, as some of you know. And uh, I have one quick comment and then a, a question on a separate subject. My comment is to agree pretty fully with uh, uh, Jim Dobbins in terms of what should be the development strategy looking ahead with the necessary important area of exports of manufacturers. And my problem with Professor Dupuis' presentation is I didn't hear the alternative strategy. I certainly don't see a country of 10 million people with very small and declining arable land having a strategy centered on Mongo exports, quite frankly. Uh, and also, in, in the historical context, I won't go into any detail, but the reason the burgeoning uh, manufacturing industry in Haiti left, and it's the most, <laughs> it can move most quickly, uh, was that the, the government was beginning to impose uh, restraints and restrictions, and the, the, uh, the electronic sector was even the most important. It was moving up the production ladder, bringing in skilled workers from Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, let me tell you, if, uh, you have to be able to, to deliver on schedule. That is central, and particularly the Christmas season. And in the late 80s, early 90s, when they couldn't do it anymore, they, they're mobile. They just left the sheds and moved elsewhere. So I think this has to be looked at. And uh, there are problems on the agricultural side. And one last thing, sorry to belabor a little bit. Uh, when I was down there in the early 80s, uh, on the agricultural side, I opposed sending rice into Haiti, PL 480 Title I. I was the ambassador, incidentally, at that time. They couldn't say no to my objection. The USDA maybe never forgave me, but we did make some efforts, at least, and occasionally. Now, I, my question, though, has to do with this big issue of corruption, which, which Bob did raise and wasn't really discussed. 
And, uh, and this is uh, just to elaborate a little bit and ask the question, because this has been a problem throughout Haitian history, uh, and it's even more threatening now with the government being sort of decimated by the earthquake. It is an internal problem in the economic losses, but also the people in the countryside and the NGOs. They see government officials and government regulation as financial predators, not assistants. And this is true in Haitian literature as well as history. And uh, so the problem is, but it's an external problem uh, because you lose aid donor support in this country and elsewhere when these stories keep popping up in the Miami Herald and elsewhere of how this money gets uh, stolen. So some, this really has to be I think, uh, addressed more deeply and, and, and fully. And you can't just do it by an audit committee in the, in the, uh, uh, what are the what's the IHRC? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it has to be in the ministries, not approval, but how the money is spent. And, and that, I, I believe, should be looked at seriously. And I'll just give one more example how we were occasionally – we were usually successful in the early 80s, USAID, and frustrated the Miami Herald, quite frankly. What we did when there was a project in the public sector, in the ministry, we would have one person there on the AID payroll. That person had to co-sign every check when it came to implementation, and that person's job was to report back exactly where that money was going. And that was, a gr and that that was largely quite successful. Maybe that doesn't work today, but I think you need a broader strategy than just to have some audit committee out there on the outside and not where this unprecedented hundreds of millions of dollars is going internally. Thank you. Okay. Any um, comments on that? Yeah. I'm, one of the heartening things that when, when we were in Haiti we found was that there's been this concerted effort to provide tighter electronic financial controls. And after the earthquake, actually, the servers, they lost one server, but the financial controls were on a server that survived. And so... What has happened is they had all these discretionary accounts which, you know, somebody could sign a check and off it would go with government funds. And the amount of funds that have been leaking from those types of accounts has just dropped uh, precipitously. So um, through, and there's nothing like electronic controls and accountability that you, you can do something about corruption and actually over the last four or five years at least in in that particular way of leaking um, they made significant progress, and they have more more to go. Okay. Um, thank you, Ernie. Uh, let's turn to this side, please. Hi, I'm Christy Martins with DAI. I'm DAI's project manager for the USAID OTI-funded Haiti Recovery Initiative Program. I've been spending about half my time in Haiti since the earthquake. Um, I'm happy to see everyone agrees that uh, we need to strengthen the Haitian government at both the national and local levels. Um, I have about a million questions in that regard, but I think I've managed to condense them into two as I've been waiting here. The first is, as we talk about civil service reform um, and potentially improving uh, efficiencies within the government at both the national and local level, um, I wonder how that – what your thoughts are on um, – you know, when there is too many people doing the same job and when there is inefficiency there, how do you address that problem considering, um, you know, the high unemployment rates in Haiti? Um, what, is, what is the intention um, when you see in the Ministry of Finance 10 people doing the job that one person could do? Um, on a related question, also related to unemployment, is um, tax revenues and what, what, what your thoughts are on... Uh, increasing the amount of tax revenues that it are the government receives at both the national and local levels in a country with such high unemployment without stimming growth in the economic sector and overtaxing businesses and, um, and the wealthy? Well, I mean, uh, people who work in the government have much, much higher standards of living than, than people on the countryside, and, and a lot of the – and everybody pays – the, the big source of tax revenue in Haiti is through tariffs or for VAT, which means that everybody pays them. So um, I just don't see why someone who makes a lot of money should be exploiting people who are, you know, very, very poor by sitting around in a government office and not doing a job. So uh, the, a better way to make provide value for the Haitians is to carefully go through and look at what needs to be done, and if someone is not doing a job that needs to be done and contributes to the country, they definitely shouldn't be subsidized by the poorest of the poor to do that. Um, your second question was? 
how to increase tax revenue. How to increase tax revenue. Um, uh, Jim and I differ a little bit here. I don't really want to increase tax revenue until I'm sure the Haitian government is going to spend it on something that's worthwhile. And when I went through the figures, yes, they have very, very low take on GDP, but they provide very, very little in terms of public services. And if you look at other countries of Haiti's standard you know, per capita incomes, um, they expend appreciable amounts of money in education, provide education service and public health care services. Currently, Haitian government doesn't do that. So you say, well, they take 10% of GDP. What does it go for? It you know, goes to pay people maybe not doing very much. And so um, I think that first and foremost we want to look at uh, making sure that there's accountability and, and uh, provision of real public services. And I think once there's some signs that the Haitian government is actually making progress there, um, there's a host of recommendations from raising value-added tax. You can put on property tax, as we mentioned, is a great way to go because uh, you can actually hit some of the rich that way. Um, and then maybe uh, income taxes are kind of tough in that type of economy, but, you know, there's a host of ways you could raise tax revenues, but I think you first and foremost have to make sure that those revenues are used effectively. Jim, did you want to comment on that? No, I got you. Okay, fine. Um, it always comes down to this. We have more questions than we have time for. So what I'm going to do is ask our three remaining folks here to each present yourself and your question so that we can try to group them and get them answered. Okay, we'll start here. Garrett Johnson with the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, thank you for all of your comments. They've been very enlightening. I wanted to touch a bit and follow up on the, uh, the tax issue uh, Secretary Clinton a few weeks ago made an interesting con uh, comment in the context of Pakistan and bemoaned uh, the very low, around 1 or 2 percent uh, of Pakistani citizens, 180 million of them, uh, who pay taxes. Uh, and now, in light of the uh, catastrophic flooding, uh, they need about $30 billion to rebuild their country, uh, and it's, they're looking to the international community to pay for it. Uh, and so I find... Uh, your, your comment somewhat troubling uh, because if we don't raise uh, tax revenue in the country, uh, then the, the international community is stuck with the bill. And so I agree that the, uh, the institutional capacity must be strengthened before we raise taxes uh, on the impoverished Haitians, but I don't necessarily agree that we should be willing to spend U.S. Payer, taxpayer dollars into a system that is broken. Uh, so she made the comment, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, that um, that was a non-sustainable model and that the U.S. should consider uh, potentially not investing as much resources in countries where they don't see clear markers, clear progress towards reforms. Uh, so I would love to hear your perspective on what progress you have seen in the way of reforms, whether it be increasing the business climate, uh, land tenure, uh, and if we haven't seen those reforms, then there are, if there are no clear indications that those progress towards those reforms are being made, then should the U.S. beyond non-essential humanitarian aid reconsider investing substantial funds into Haiti or other countries uh, where those uh, limited institutional capacity problems exist? Okay, hold your thought on that. Let's get two more questions. Thank you. Uh, Anda Adams from the Brookings Institution. With regards to the U.S. government strategy, I certainly understand the, the concept behind choosing uh, priorities and establishing pillars um, and working in areas where the other donors aren't playing. I'm curious about what the process was for sort of determining what areas, what sectors, and then what, more importantly, I guess, what's the ongoing mechanism for ensuring that we don't have gaps going forward? Um, I'm coming particularly from looking at the education sector. As former President Clinton said last week, you know, establishing universal education is essential in, in Haiti. Um, you mentioned, Megan, that our social services delivery in the past has not been in a sustainable way, but kind of what is the – and the, the French and the Canadians, you know, have, are going to take the lead – on education, but I think there's concern in general about pulling out of that sector uh, more specifically from the from the U.S. perspective. So I'd love to hear just more about, you know, how do we make sure there aren't gaps going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And our final question, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, my concern was more about the intermediate term. Now, obviously, a lot of this is long-term goal objectives. Um, in particular, we've done studies. Uh, I'm, at, I'm Royce Hudson. I'm at Wayne State University School of Social Work looking in particular violence against women, which has already been touched upon, and other sort of human rights conditions in Haiti. Currently, we found that there's an extreme amount of human rights violations among, uh, especially in the IDP camps. And I'm wondering, going forward, the intermediate outcomes or the intermediate uh, 
conditions within Haiti are going to impact long-term outcomes going forward. And I'm wondering, you know, what the panel uh, considerations were, for instance, security among IDP residents and even other Haitians, uh, especially with regards to violence against women, because the rates are quite astounding. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you. We have um, the question on taxes, the question on uh, U.S. stance in education programs, and then our concern about their intermediate terms. Panel, it's all yours. Let me just talk about tax revenues. I think there's a difference between disasters and um, in kind of a steady state tax and expenditure policies. Uh, in the United States, if we have uh, tornadoes in Kansas or Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans or elsewhere, uh, you know, the the rest of the country steps up and helps people there. And I, I in this case, both for Haiti after the earthquake and Pakistan after the floods, it is reasonable to ask uh, international community to step forward. I agree completely, however, for a longer-term focus is that um, I, the donor community does have a responsibility to make sure that they back away, you know, that they have a sustained plan to back away and that um, it is not good for Haitians or not good for anybody to not uh, work with the government to make sure that the Haitian government at some point in time, at some trajectory, you know, in a reasonable amount of time is going to take increasing responsibility for paying for social services. Um, what I, um, and I, it's Pakistan is a case in point. And Pakistan uh, does have expenditure plans for education. It's not great. Uh, do some public health. They, could, they definitely need more tax revenue. I think in the case of Haiti, my problem has been is uh, they're not where Pakistan is. They don't have a uh, public education system. They haven't really moved forward on, on public health and that they need to get those in um, up and running at that point in time, then you can you can slowly uh, increase the tax take in order to cover those expenditures. Um, let, let me just address the issue of how to avoid gaps. Although I think Megan would probably want to uh, address this as well, um, because you know, in a sense, we are actually advocating gaps. We're advocating concentrating on a few uh, uh, key issues and implicitly arguing to diminish the focus on others. Um, the view is that if you do everything, you're doing nothing well, and that nothing will make a difference, and the next time you have an earthquake or a hurricane, everything will go back to exactly the situation you find today, and we'll be funding Haiti forever. Um, uh, and that you need to go to a few key things. Now, we're not arguing that one, if you funded them adequately, you shouldn't then address other uh, 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 other uh, needs, uh, but we are arguing for more focus. Now, we do include education as one of the areas of our focus, um, although, as, as, as Keith has noted, uh, there we believe in the short term the focus should be on getting the state, uh, 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 creating a competence within the state to uh, oversee uh, and uh, create certain educational standards in the country uh, and uh, supplement uh, through subsidies and other forms uh, what the private sector can do rather than compete with the private sector in actually providing educational services since we don't believe that the state in the short term by which we in the next five years is going to be able to make significant strides there. I'll, I'll take um, both the first and, and second question. Um, on the issue of what, what kinds of reforms is the Haitian government willing to take on um, that we can feel that there's a real, that we have a real partner in this. Um, two things that I think are sort of promising that uh, going forward uh, is a um, work being done by the IDB with um, the Ministry of Commerce and other parts of the Haitian government um, to really um, move the needle on doing business indicators. One is um, uh, starting a business entity uh, um, within the Ministry of Commerce and another affiliated organization within the uh, within the Haitian government to shave off of approximately 200 days off the process for starting a business. Um, the second is obtaining construction permits. Um, they're in discussions about creating what is effectively some uh, an outsourcing mechanism uh, where a private entity can uh, do the work, but uh, is is essentially contracted by. Uh, the Haitian government, and this is astounding, taking it from 1,081 days to 63 days. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of talking about how do you raise tax revenue, one of the big things is to, to give people reason to participate in the formal economy. 
um, in in Haiti, when you were faced with you know over 200 to 400 days to get a business license and 1,081 days to get a construction permit, you have no incentive to participate in the formal economy. And it's not a matter of making taxes, you know, unbearable for small and medium-sized businesses. It's it's making giving them incentives to actually participate in the formal economy whatsoever. And I think that that uh, could have a tremendous impact if you were able to really um, move the, you know, it, it is a small slice of the economy that is the SME businesses, but they've got to be a part of the formal system, and that's going to be the driver of economic growth long term. I think if we can make reform, we can work with the Haitian government to make reforms on that uh, side, I think that that's a, a great step forward. Um, on the question of gap filling, um, uh, I would say actually, you know, conversely, um, that, you know, us not focusing on some of the the areas that, um, for instance, education um, is not necessarily leaving a gap. Um, first of all, because we were never a big player in the space to start with. We spent about $12 million a year, and we will continue to spend $12 million a year on education. Um, we've also just given uh, $10 million through the Haiti Reconstruction Fund to support the IDB's uh, overall education reform plan. But education is not a sector that necessarily uh, occupies or, or represents a big gap. Uh, education is the, is the sector in Haiti that most private donors and, I would say, uh, you know, a, a gr large number of public donors are most interested in supporting. Um, and a recent report that came out from the Office of Special Envoy showed that the majority of funding right now is actually directed towards the education sector. Um, so the gaps that um, that we need to fill are, are some of these things that are much uh, less appealing to donors to fund, which is the institutional reform. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, the IHRC will play a large role in in um, setting these priorities. And for for gaps that exist, I think the Haiti Reconstruction Fund uh, will be a really valuable uh, resource. Uh, for instance, debris removal. Nobody wants to do debris removal. Um, uh, even though this was not something that we set out to do initially after the earthquake, we have been the single largest funder of debris removal, and yet we have uh, not managed to move more than 5% of the debris in, in Port-au-Prince. The Haiti Reconstruction Fund is going to be the best vehicle for getting that done. It's the way that we can consolidate lots of small donors and big donors, um, and the Haitian government can say, this is our top priority, you know, this is what we're going to spend the money on. And in fact, you know, in the last two sessions of the IHRC, we managed to get the uh, UN's debris removal program fully funded, and so that should get started now. So that's, I think, going to be both the, the combination of the IHRC and the HRF, the Haiti Reconstruction Fund, will be the, the real vehicle for filling gaps as they, as they arise. Uh, I just want to say about the violence against women. Uh, this is a very, indeed, a very s serious issue in the camps, um, and it's quite obvious that the minister and the Haitian police need to pay to police those areas more effectively, but also to reinforce the, the committees that have been created in these camps that are very much concerned about these issues of safety and so on. But obviously. The, the, the most long-lasting solution is to find meaningful housing for these folks um, and uh, jobs. So I think uh, you know the housing issue, solving the housing problem in the camps is, is crucial in addition to the policing and uh, reinforcing of the committee, the, the committees. There have been you know most of the camps are organized into committees, but they don't have much support. Um, and so I think that's that is a serious issue. So thank thanks for bringing it up, whoever brought it up. It's a, it's a concern. Okay, well um, we have reached the uh, witching hour here, and I think if there's one common thread that I heard today, it's the support of a reconstituted Haitian state, um, not one that, as we used to say, was predatory, and not one as today, which is largely absent but one which can render services, one which can regulate, one which can serve the citizens of Haiti. Um, I wish to thank you all for coming today, and I wish to thank those watching via the webcast uh, for staying with us. Um, and before we thank the panelists, I just want to remind you again that we will reconvene here on the morning of October 29th, and the principal speaker that morning will be former Prime Minister of Haiti, Michel Pierre-Louis. So can we thank our panelists for a great job? Thank you.